Hey, morning once again. Let's uh, get started. We'll just pray and then we'll start. Yeah, okay. Father, we, we just want to thank you, Lord, for this day. Uh, we give you praise. We thank you, Lord, that you, you're the one who watches over us. You know, let's just give thanks to God. Uh, thank him for all that he's done. Thank you for, the, for who he is in your life, in my life. Um, just give him thanks, give him praise. Uh, just acknowledge that he is God. You know, recognize his hand. <clears throat> recognize his provision, recognize his presence in each one of our lives. And so, let's just give thanks. Father, we thank you. We bless your name, God. We bless your name. We thank you for your grace, God. We thank you for your faithfulness, O oh Master. We thank you for your presence and your power in our lives, Father God. We thank you. We bless your name, God. We bless your name. We bless your name, Father God. Yes, Lord, I pray that, uh, Lord, Spirit of God, that you would write your word upon our hearts and minds even today, Father God. Lord, let um. Let our thinking change. Let our imaginations change, Father God. Let our perspectives change, O oh God. Lord, about each and everything, Father God, the way you see it, Lord, we want to see, Master. And Lord, to that end, O oh God, we commit ourselves into your mighty hands. We give you all the praise and all the glory at this time. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's um, just pick up from where we um, stopped last class. We, I think, reached the end of um, uh, wrong attitudes, right? Some of the right attitudes, some of the wrong attitudes that we can have about money. And the last one we looked at was about uh, false security, right? False security meaning false confidence. Um, <clears throat> we can have confidence we can put our confidence in money because money can do a lot of things right money can buy us comfort money can buy us uh, you know material comfort and material possessions and so on so we can it's not it's natural to put our confidence saying that i have this therefore i can be confident i have you know so much money therefore i can you know tomorrow i don't have to worry or you know it's it's normal to put our confidence in money right so the bible but the bible talks about not to put our trust in uncertain riches right because riches can go up riches can come down um so not to put our trust in uncertain riches so which means uh, the right attitude is to thank god for the provision that he brings into our lives but to trust him who is the provider rather than the provision itself right to trust him who gives all things rather than the things that he is giving okay so uh, so we looked at some of uh, all those wrong attitudes that we could have we looked at several scriptures also okay so let's look at this word you no know, prosperity okay so we we saw that the word prosperity it includes money but it's not just about money. Okay. Prosperity, it's not just about money. Okay. So when we say somebody's prosperous, we are pros the word prosperity also means success. Right? Because you know, let's say you're saying, you know, uh, you, you you might have heard the you know phrase that you know, may you prosper in the things that you set your hands to. Right, which means whatever project you're taking, whatever work that you want to do, may you prosper in it. May you be good at it. Right? May you be successful in it. Right? And um, especially if you if you look at um, John's third epistle, that is three John and verse two. So John prays this for the believers. He says, "Beloved." I pray that you may prosper in all things. Okay? That you may prosper in all things. Which means that prosperity is not just um, constrained or restricted to money. Okay? It's not just restricted to finances. He says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things. So when we say prosperous, it means to be successful. It means to have increase. It means to flourish. Okay, 
So, he, he, in fact, in, in this verse, 3 John verse 2, he says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper and be in health just as your soul prospers. Right? Just as your soul prospers, which means, you know, does it mean that your soul is rich with money? No, it, it talks about our soul, our mind, our will, our imaginations, right? Our mental health, saying, let it prosper, let it thrive, let it flourish, right? Okay, so let's again come back to that word prosper. Prosperity, it means to be successful, it means uh, to be, you know, to have increase, to have growth. So when we say biblical prosperity, okay, so this is what, you know, somebody defined it like this, biblical prosperity is divinely enabled, you know, if you, if you can look at the notes, it's there, it's divinely enabled success, growth, and increase, okay? Biblical prosperity is divinely enabled. What does divinely enabled mean? What does it mean? To say it's divinely enabled. Divine? Something to do with God? Something to do with, uh, you know, uh, all about Him, how He um, brings about. So it's about God, right? So divinely enabled. What does enabled mean? To enable something. Sorry? Help. Help, facilitate empower right so biblical prosperity is divinely enabled which means god empowered god helped god facilitated okay success growth increase right biblical prosperity when you talk about biblical prosperity is divinely enabled god enabled god given right god enabled success growth increase through Divinely appointed means. So what does that mean? Divinely appointed means. Any idea? Divinely, divinely appointed, we know. Okay, God appointed, God ordained, right? Uh, or God inspired means, ways, methods, processes, ventures. Right? God inspired, God appointed methods or ways. Third one, for divinely appointed purposes. Okay. So what is this whole thing for? That is the, the purpose of biblical prosperity. Right? So let's look at look at that again. So biblical prosperity, when we can when we look at it, it, it means it's divinely um, enabled, divinely enabled success or growth or increase through divinely appointed means, which means God appointed, God ordained ways, okay? And through divinely appointed, for a divinely appointed, sorry, purposes, right? It's for his purpose, whatever that could be, right? So, so let's, you know, it, it's good for us to get this inside of us. Okay, biblical prosperity is, you know, God ordained, it's God appointed. Right? Uh, God enabled, God empowered. It's all about God. You know how how does He inspire? How does He enable me? How does He empower me for success? How does He empower me for growth? How does He empower me for you know thriving and to increase in all the areas right of my life? So, God appointed ways, which means that um, see there can be if you, if you just take that God appointed out of it, you know there can be man's ways also, right? Prosperity can come in other ways also, which means that maybe God didn't enable you. God didn't appoint that, those ways. And maybe it's not for God's purposes. Right? So a, a person can be prosperous in those ways also. Right? And I just want to you know, talk about this God-appointed means, which is very important, because um, you know, I, I don't know if you've heard this phrase, the end justifies the means. Have you heard that phrase? The end justifies the means. No? Okay. <laughs> the end justifies the means. Okay, which means that the end result or the objective, what are we actually going after? Okay. 
that justifies whatever method you use okay so suppose i'm going to give money to the poor okay so let's say okay asapu wants to give a lakh of money to the poor okay so that's the objective that's the end so how is he going to get that lakh what is the means of getting that lakh Asabu says that you don't worry, right? I will, I will do anything and everything. I will, I will borrow, I will steal, I will threaten, right? I will do anything. But what is the end? I want to serve the people. I want to give to the poor people. So that is the end, justifying the means. You know, you're saying this is. I want to give to the poor. It's a noble thing. So I'm justified in. Doing whatever I want, I want to. I want to borrow. I want to. You know, I I might borrow. I want to, um, let's say, uh, steal from the rich. He anyway has money. Unlike I will steal from them, right? That bank has money. I will steal. I will cheat. I will get the money. Why am I doing it? I'm doing it to honor God. And I want to give to God's people. I want to give those people who are poor. Is it right or wrong? Why? Sorry. Yeah, but why is it wrong? Intrinsically, why is it wrong? The okay, the intent to serve, but the what is the method, the means, or the way in which you go about serving is is absolutely wrong. Right, because the Bible talks about the fact that in Psalm 23 says, "He leads me." Who? It is Psalmist is testifying about God, the Good Shepherd. He leads me. How does he lead me? In the paths of righteousness. Okay, in paths of righteousness. And then the second part of, the, of that verse, for His name's sake, which means He is righteous. He is holy, right? For His name's sake, He leads me in paths of righteousness. Okay, so the end just does not justify the means. You can have a very noble purpose, very noble thing, noble project, but how do we go about achieving that result? And how do we go about achieving or carrying out that project or carrying out whatever we that? You know, reaching that target, that's very important because, and and so also in case in in the you know what are, what are we, what are we talking about? We're talking about prosperity. Okay, so prosperity. Okay, it's a good thing because God is not against prosperity. But how do we go about being prosperous? You know, that's what we're saying. It's God appointed means. Right? God appointed means which means God is in it, which means it, it cannot be something that's unholy. If God is in it, that it cannot be something that is impure, right? Something that is uh, something that is against His character and nature. So it's God-appointed ways, God-appointed means. So that is biblical prosperity. It's it's God-enabled. God wants to enable. God is de God's God's desire is to take us to a place of success and growth and increase. Right? It's God-enabled, but at the same time, it, if it's going to be God-appointed. Biblical prosperity is about God appointed ways, God appointed means, which means that it is these are ways of righteousness, right? And for God appointed success, God appointed purposes, right? Okay, so so we you know the question we we sometimes ask is why why prosperity? You know, should a Christian uh, you know, desire prosperity, desire to be successful, uh, desire to increase? Uh, desire, growth, and development. Should a Christian do that? What is the right motivation? So we will address all these questions. Okay. So uh, what we talked about, the the end just thought, the, does not justify the means. Okay. Which means that a lie cannot serve the truth. Okay. So God leads us in paths of righteousness. Psalm twenty three three, the verse that we saw. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Okay. Um, so, 
um, Second Chronicles 16 and verse 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong. Okay, so God is literally searching his, his eyes run to and fro to show himself strong, okay, to display himself, his strength, on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Okay, so God wants to show himself strong uh, on behalf of those is, uh, whose heart is loyal to him. You know, and the second part is about that warning and the consequence of not being loyal and so on. Right. So we can experience... God enabled growth. We can experience God enabled prosperity because He wants to show Himself strong. Okay, so we're going to look at several other, um, you know, um, verses as well. Okay, so this um, scripture, these scripture, you can read it. I'm not going to go into, uh, you know, the uh, entire portion. It's a, it's a fairly large portion about Jacob. Okay, let me just paraphrase it. Uh, Jacob, Jacob says, God, you know, you, um, you know, I'm going back to my father's house. I want, I need to come back. And uh, Lord, I, I will, um, you know, you, I will pay a tenth uh, of all that you are giving me. He makes that, you know, promise to God. Uh, we see that in Genesis 28. Right? I'm, I'm going to pay a tenth. I'm going to pay a tithe of all that you have uh, given to me and so on. So then he works with uh, Laban and um, you know, and we and we know, and then he comes. He has this conversation with, uh, with Leban, and he says, "You know, I, I need to go back. Give me your, uh, send me, give me my wages. Right? I want to go back to my father's house, and I've been here serving you faithfully. Give me my wages." And then, uh, so Leban says, "Okay, um, what is it? What do you want? What shall I give you?" And Jacob says, "You know, I will take everything in your flock, in the, in the sheep and the goat." Everything that is speckled, everything that is uh, that that is not purely white, okay. So which means it's uh, you know when it's uh, when it's of the white color and everything, you know it's 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 supposed to be of good quality. You know if a sheep is of one particular shade. Uh, so what he's saying is I'll take everything that is not like that. I'll take everything that is speckled, everything that is you know spotted. I'll take that, okay. And something happens. Something very strange happens. Um, he 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 does something which is in the natural, but something that produces a supernatural effect, right? So, in all those sheep, he he puts b before them, he peels off the bark of the almond tree and the poplar tree. It says, and then he puts among he puts that in front of their eyes, and when they give birth to the calves, the small ones. They are actually strong, but then what they notice is that they are speckled and spotted and so on. Okay, So every time you give birth, which means that uh, they are speckled and spotted, which means that Jacob's flock increases so much more than Laban's uh, flock. Okay, so, uh, so he does that and he becomes very, very prosperous. Okay, so... So we see that in the natural, you know, that is that is not possible. But we see it's a it's a supernatural, you know, above the natural uh, hand of God that actually causes him to prosper. Okay, so we see that. So all that to say that biblical prosperity is God appointed. Biblical prosperity is God enabled. Biblical prosperity is for God's purposes. Okay, whatever that purpose could be. Right, um, and when we say God's purposes, um, you know, we, we we don't have to think. Obviously, at the end of it, people God wants people to be blessed, redeemed, uh, and we looked at all those, you know, the right attitudes that we need to have about money. That they might be, that people might be helped. Those who do not have enough might be helped. You know, that uh, uh, there might be enough for the work of God's kingdom. Right, all these things are true when we say God appointed purposes. Okay? But it also means that God takes pleasure in you and I having success, having growth, and uh, being prosperous. Okay, So God takes pleasure in that. That for you, per, for you and I personally to have, uh, to be prosperous. Many times we, I don't know, uh, many times people are not Comfortable with that idea. Why? 
because we've seen the abuse of wealth we've seen the we've seen greed we've seen covetousness right we've seen corruption because of wealth okay and so we are not comfortable you know it could be in ministry it could be in politics whatever it is you know we've seen the negative side of what money can do and therefore we are not comfortable uh, with the fact that hey here is god and he actually delights in prospering me right so see when, when we when we're looking at poverty or not having enough we are comfortable with that yes or no we're okay with that you know i don't have enough um, you know but i'm trusting god you know yes we are comfortable with that idea but sometimes we are very uncomfortable with the fact that he god is actually providing god is putting in enough and more money um he's giving a lot of things and uh, he's making sure that a lot of money passes through my hands right just imagine like a tap so that it flows through others we're not very comfortable with that okay so so we just need to make that shift hey god is not against prospering me when when we say god appointed purpose well that could well include me my family others right it could it would well include me so that i can be a source through god i can be a source of help i can be a source of blessing to so many others right look at look at it that way right okay in the bible we see that there were people whom god prospered okay so so if, if you're not comfortable with that idea oh, can god really prosper man you can really uh, god be okay with prospering me giving me things giving me money right so let's look into the bible let's look into the word of god and see how generation after generation how god prospered his people okay and here it talks about you know material things it talks about faith okay uh, let's look at abraham okay uh, turn to if you turn to uh, genesis 24 it's we're on page number 8 in the notes okay okay what is your idea of abraham when you say abraham and all of us and maybe if we have grown up in church okay as little children we grew up hearing the stories sometimes they give us these books right to color some their paper to color and send and that picture stays right so in your picture of abraham does abraham have a beard yes <laughs> yeah does he have long hair yes does he have a coat robe yeah in my picture he has a robe which is striped for some reason i think that is one of the pictures that i colored so he has a robe is he wearing sandals he's wearing sandals so where is he in your picture of abraham where is he actually what is the surrounding like can you imagine you know abraham we always imagine right we imagine okay abraham Isaac we, we imagine we have certain picture of Abraham whenever we read so in your picture what is it like of Abraham where is he where where is he staying what kind of a place it is is it online folks also sanjay lucy you can post what do you think where is he in your mind or we have not thought about it yeah go ahead yeah so god's friend that's the first imagery that comes in god's friend yeah and, so he's a friend uh, of god always very much in the presence of god but uh, you know when you're elaborating and asking mm -hmm. when you think of it in a little more deeper sense mm -hmm. and uh, the way god has blessed him so mm -hmm. then you can uh, get a feeling like you know surrounded with a lot of uh, cattle and earth and yeah you know, uh, materialistic possessions possessions well. yeah so by in my imagine in my mind see he lives in a tent and i've seen tents 
right tent is uh, very simple structure some canvas tarpaulin right and i'm not really gone camping in the you know trekking or, or camping so i i don't have that in mind maybe once i stayed in a tent you know one one youth camp stayed in a tent and uh, that's you know that's all so it was a very simple structure some poles canvas lying on the ground simple so that's the thing and then i know you know this is we are talking about uh, mid mid uh, mid eastern yeah um yeah i'm just talking about the physical uh, thing um you know deepu and uh, lucy yeah how can you imagine abraham to be so uh, in my mind you know it's 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 a it's a dry place lot of dust lot of stones okay so dry terrain sandal they're saying heat lot of heat the sun is shining forever summer you know that's i don't know for accurate or not that's the picture i have right and he's going he's walking and uh, you know god asked him to come out and go to a land he's, he's going with this family and praying and and all these things now when we look at genesis 24 we get a completely different picture from what i was thinking i get a completely different picture right look at genesis 24 um verse 1 says now abraham was old well advanced in age and the lord had blessed abraham in all things okay so what does all things mean all things <laughs> very simple right all things mean all things okay verse 34 so he said you know who's this abraham's servant okay he's testifying okay um so he's saying i am abraham's servant verse 35 the lord has blessed my master greatly and he has become great and he has given him flocks and herds silver and gold male and female servants and camels and donkeys okay it's not just one sheep one cattle one donkey one camel one person to you know is a male and female servants which means you know there were families who were serving maybe there were people who were taking care of the herds right so it's a it's it's like on big ranch you know and when they are traveling it's like one one huge uh, you know movement that's happening can you imagine camels right so tall so big and how much it it can drink how much it can eat right if you seen cattle they eat all day they are constantly chewing something right they are always eating you need to take care you need to give so cattle donkeys donkeys obviously they used for transportation you know it's like it's like saying he had a whole fleet of cars <laughs> right camels they transported you know they, they traveled on donkeys they traveled on camels and uh, you know the 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 cattle and they used for milk and other things so uh, sheep and cattle everything is there and he's having so many people to look after so he is actually you know in those days even if you compare to you know make up make a comparison to today's day he's he's a very wealthy man and that's why his servant is my master is very wealthy he has all these servants he has gold he has silver he has all this material things and he and he testifies saying god has blessed him and the verse one also says that abraham was old well advanced in age and god has had blessed him in all things right so abraham so our picture needs to change it, it was not like he was wearing you know rags right it was not like he was living in uh, you know he, he was living well he was he had people who were connected to his life which means he had to take care of them right he had all these sheep and cattle and you know, all this transportation and, and all that was there and god had blessed him right so we see that okay let's look at isaac okay um, so this is genesis 26 as uh, 26 verses 12 to 14 then isaac sowed in that land right and it, actually if you look at that chapter it talks about famine okay it talks about famine in the land and he wants to move out but then god 
says, you know, you stay here. So, yeah. So it says here, then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold because God asked him to. So it's God appointed, God enabled. The Lord blessed him. The man began to prosper, verse 13, and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. Okay, so we're looking at this kingdom or this group of people, these Philistines, they actually were jealous that he had so much. Who are we talking about? How about Isaac? Who is Isaac? The promised son, right? Of Abraham. So here it's saying that you know, this is what he, he continued to prosper and became very prosperous. So much so, this other group of people, you know, they see this and they became jealous. They envied him, meaning, you know, how, how come he's like this? Because God actually, you know, gives him something that goes beyond natural, you know, human reasoning. Ask him to stay in that place in famine and continue to, you know, go do agriculture. Right? If you look at, if you go through um, chapter 26, that's what we see, right? So he does that and he had possessions. Okay, this is what he says. So again, our picture of you know God's dealings with his people, Abraham, Isaac. Okay, what, we'll go to the next generation, which is Jacob. Right? Genesis 30, verse 43. Thus the man became exceedingly prosperous and had large flocks, male and female servants and camels and donkeys. We see the same pattern. Right? Same thing. His grandfather, his father, now him, right? Then Joseph, following generation, right? We're looking at the fourth generation now. Genesis 39. The Lord was with Joseph and he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. This is uh, Potiphar. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. So here he's talking about being successful. He's talking about, you know, even maybe financial wealth and so on. So he's, he's a slave. He's a slave in Egypt. He's a slave in the master's house. But the Lord is with him, causing him to prosper, being successful. Whatever work was given, he was successful. You know, maybe he was asked to go and sell some things in the market. He comes back with a profit, successful, right? He's asked to take care of some things and oversee some, you know, servants. He's successful. He may, he solves problems in a good way. He he brings to people together. Maybe maybe they are happy working for Potiphar, so he's successful, right? In all that he did, the Bible says that the Lord made all he did to prosper. Okay, um, look at that verse, um, verse 23. Now, we, from, the, from this place, Potiphar's place, he goes to the prison, right? So what does it say there? The authority, the keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Okay, so, he's, so we might think of, you know, maybe Abraham and... You know, uh, Isaac and Jacob, you know, they, they were all, you know, good land. They were free men, free people. They had servants and everything. And God made them prosperous. You might say, hey, the, the situation is good. The environment is good. Right? The place where they are is good. And therefore, they are successful. Now, we look at Joseph. He's a slave. He's successful. He's in prison and he is thriving. It says that the keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's under Joseph's authority. And, and in the prison, the keeper of the prison has given him authority. Okay, you take care of feeding the prisoners, you take care of the rations, you take care of something, you know, some something, some responsibility is given him. And he's saying that he did not look into anything that was given to Joseph because he was successful. 
happened. And the Bible testifies the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it, excuse me, prosper. So we see that, hey, it doesn't depend on the circumstance, doesn't depend on the environment. The Lord can cause us to prosper. The Lord can cross, ca cause us to grow and increase and be successful. OK, one more. Uh, Job, Job 42, verse 10. And the Lord restored Job's losses when he prayed for his friends. Indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. OK, many times when we think about Job, when we study Job, we talk about the suffering, right? This loss that he went through. Yeah, and and you know that's a big part of the book, right? But look at these verses, and it talks about God's dealing with Job after he had gone through all that. And it takes and it says here, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Okay, that's how it ends, right? It doesn't end with the loss and suffering, it ends with the restoration. Okay, one more verse, verse 12. Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. For he had, you know, his wealth is listed there. And I'm, I'm sure it listed there for a purpose. You just think about that. You know, why is you know, somebody's savings account, somebody, you know, he had so many people, he had, uh, you, know, uh, you know, so much in his bank, he had so many, why is it, why is it listed there, right? We, we won't normally you know, go and tell people that well, this is how much I have. But why is it listed here? Think about it, right? It says uh, he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 1, yoke of oxen. I know how big is that? 1,000 cattle? Can you just imagine how many cattle can be kept here in that place, that field there? How many? 50. That's it in that field. Not more than that. Comfortably, right? You have to feed them. You have to make sure. Yet 1,000. Either the Bible is exaggerating or, you know, somebody is wrong or somebody is right. 1,000 ox, yoke of oxen and 1,000 female donkeys, which means there was male donkeys, which was not counted. 14,000 sheep. 14,000, not just 1,400,000. You know, we heard those sheep going. Just imagine the noise it will make in the morning when you want to feed it. 14,000, right? So it says that the Lord restored twice. Actually, if you look at the, you know, what he had beginning, it's an exact double of what he had, right? His wealth. So the, that's how the book ends, right? That's how Job's life ends. Job's life story ends that restoration, there is increase, there is growth, there is success, despite all that he went through. Okay, so that tells us something that God, the God whom we worship, the God of the Bible, is not holding back or is not against prospering men, women. Right? He's not against it. Because he's done it in the Bible. And the Bible very clearly says it's not them, but it's God who actually prospered them. Right? And when you say God is prospering them, yeah, obviously they, you know, they must have thrived, flourished. He's talking about money as well. He's talking about material things. Right? And we know Abraham was a person of faith, right? A person of great faith. Romans, you know, Romans chapter 5, you know, we, we read through that. It talks about that, that how against hope, in hope, he believed, gave glory to God. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but, you know, he gave glory to God, increased in faith, right? And so on. So he flourished in, in all these ways. Okay. Um, at the same time, the Bible also talks about men of God in the Bible who fell because of money. Meaning, you know, money got a hold on them rather than them holding money. Right? Money got a hold of them. They were covetous, they were greedy. Talks about Balaam, the prophet, and how he actually prophesies against the people of God because Balak said, you know, you come, I'll give you a reward. And, 
you'll prophesy and it's there in numbers 22 24 and revelation 2 14 testifies you know it says here um the lord jesus words and he says but i have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of balaam who taught balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, uh, idols and to commit sexual immorality. So it calls that the doctrine of Balaam. Okay, 2 Peter 2, verse 15 and 16, they have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Right? He wanted to do something which is against God, uh, put a curse on God's people, uh, you know, prophesy against them, but God wouldn't allow him to, right? And he was rebuked for his iniquity and so on. So we see Balaam. Then we see Gehazi in 2 Kings 5. Okay, so uh, who was Gehazi? Gehazi. Sorry? Servant of? Elisha. Okay, um, thank you. Servant of Elisha. So we read about him in 2 Kings, right? Okay, so let's turn there. Second Kings five. Okay, so the we have the. So this is what happens. Naaman, the Syrian, he comes, the commander of the Syrian army. He comes, and um, you know there's a problem with Naaman. Naaman, what is the problem? Naaman has a problem, right? What is Naaman's problem? Huh? Okay, I think we need to look at that. Second Kings five. Okay. Okay. Now Second Kings five verse one. Okay, this is what it says. Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master. Because of him, the Lord has given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor. And it says, but a leper, which means he had this skin condition, the skin disease, uh, leprosy, which was terrible in those days, and uh, no cure, etc. And the Syrian had come, come out, they had a captive, and we, don't, we read all that. Like he, he's, he's searching for a solution for some healing, uh, for a cure for this condition. And then the sermon girl says, if only... My master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, or he would heal him of his leprosy. So Naaman goes to prophet Elisha, and uh, Elisha says, "Go, dip yourself in the river Jordan," and uh, and that's what uh, you know. So Naaman is very insulted. You know, I have better rivers, bigger rivers in Syria, and why should I do this? But then, you know, the servant girls against wisdom. She said, well, "Go and wash." You know. If he had told you to do something difficult, would you not have done it? He's just asking you to do something simple. Go and wash in Jordan. Just obey the prophet. So he goes. right? Um, verse 9. Um, so verse 9, the Naaman, um, sorry, verse 9 is when he actually goes and asks, etc. Um, let's go down to verse 14. Okay, so verse 14. So he went down. He obeys, finally. He went down to the river, dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, according to Elisha. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. Okay, so he's healed. God does a supernatural work in him. And we know it's not because of the waters of Jordan, because he obeyed the word of the Lord, which came through the prophet. So he's healed. Okay, so now what happens? Um, he, he goes back to his country. He goes back to his country, and that's what you know. We see in verse twenty. He 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 actually before going, he says, "I need to give some reward. I need to give something. I want to give something." And he says, "You know, um, I I want to." Um, uh, where do we see that? Uh, he says in verse fifteen. Now, please take a gift from your servant. Okay. Please take a gift from your servant. So, but then Elisha says, "As the Lord lives, before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. You know, I don't want anything. Just go." Right. So then Neman goes, but somebody has been listening to this whole conversation. And who's that? Elisha's servant, Gehazi. Okay, so Gehazi goes after Neman and he says, See, my master has sent me. Okay, 
Now two people have come, and uh, so he goes and he says, um, uh, "My master has sent me saying, two young men of the sons of the prophets have come from the mountains of Ephraim. Please give them silver clothing, all that." He lists, he makes a list. He says two, you know, a talent of silver and two changes of clothing and all that, and then he takes. He says, "Take two talents." And uh, you know, and uh, two changes of garm uh, garments, etc. So Naaman takes it, he goes, keeps it elsewhere, and then goes before Elisha. Okay, so, so Elisha says, you know, where did you go, Naaman? Said, I nowhere. I didn't go anywhere. I was here only. Right. So he lies, and uh, Naaman, uh, Elisha says, you know, when you went, did my heart, did my spirit not go with you? And he says, you know. Um, this is what you've done is wrong. So you will actually so there is a consequence for that, right? And you the and as a result of which he becomes, you know, he becomes uh, stricken with that condition of leprosy. Okay, so so while we read about the good things, we also read about what money did in people's lives. Okay, so we read both things. The Bible is very clear. God prospered. God is God's not against it. But at the same time, we see that people, because of money, they actually fell because of greed. Right? So it was not like Gehazi was in poverty, or but something in him, you know, I want more. You know, I, he's, he's a rich man and he's offering all this, but I want some of that. Right? That caused him to fall. Okay, so uh, we'll stop here. And the, the New Testament talks about Demas and Judas Iscariot who fell for money. So um, just go through some of those scriptures and next class uh, we'll continue, right? Okay, let's uh, stop here. Thank you so much. God bless.